serenest light, the fountain of praise. Good morning, and thank you for your time and your commitment to such a worthy undertaking. I'm Greg Merriweather, welcoming you to this year's Angola Museum Symposium on Race and the Louisiana Criminal Justice System. Our founding fathers, in establishing the new Constitution of the United States government in 1789, committed to the goals of forming a more perfect union and establishing justice. As for equal justice, with regard to race, well, that wouldn't really start to appear until some 80 years later with the 14th Amendment. It, though, would be another 100 years before we'd see the enactment of groundbreaking civil rights legislation. The struggle of African Americans to get full rights and be valued as equal to whites has been an enduring struggle, to say the least. A critical component of that struggle has been the often painful relationship between African Americans and the criminal justice system. Of course, equal justice under the law is a fundamental guarantee of the Constitution and American democracy, but yet in the real lived experiences of some African Americans, equal justice has been more of a constitutional promise than an achieved reality. The historic U.S. Supreme Court case in 1896 that ruled blacks did not enjoy citizenship rights equal to whites, of course, originated in Louisiana the now infamous Plessy versus Ferguson. Until recently, Louisiana was one of only two states, with Oregon being the other, that did not require unanimous jury verdicts for criminal convictions. You don't need me to tell you that Louisiana has the highest sustained rate on incarceration in our nation. In fact, Louisiana leads the nation in no parole sentencing. As of last year, about 16% of our state's prison population consist of inmates serving life without parole. That is the highest percentage in the nation. This brief summary of racial dynamics in our state and nation provides a terrific segue into the Angola Museum's efforts today. The title of the symposium is In Pursuit of Equal Justice, Race and Criminal Justice in Louisiana, Reconstruction, Convict Leasing, Jim Crow Governance, and Prison Reform. Museums have an ethical obligation to educate the public on great issues of human affairs in our society. Now, consistent with that obligation, the Angola Museum, in its symposium, seeks to foster a discussion that accurately depicts what we've been through and where we hope to head. There is a lot to learn from Louisiana's painful history regarding race and the state's criminal justice system. The goal, though, is to create a criminal justice system which everyone will be treated so I invite you to not just sit back and enjoy, but sit up and be engaged. This morning can be a start we all need. Thanks again for your time and your attention. And now we turn things over to your moderator. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our final panel of the In Pursuit of Equal Justice, Race and Criminal Justice in Louisiana, Reconstruction, Convict Leasing, Jim Crow Governance, and Prison Reform. We would like to thank you all for joining us today, especially our panelists and our moderator that we have here today with us. We are extremely excited for, uh, that you're joining us for our final panel. Um, and I'd also like to thank everyone behind the scenes that has been a huge help and has put so much effort into working on this project. It's been great fun and we appreciate everyone's help on this. Uh, thank you for joining us today as panelists discuss the facets of racial history during the Jim Crow era and the effectiveness of recent justice, justice reforms aimed at producing a more just criminal justice system for all Louisiana citizens particularly African-Americans and suggest ideas about what equal justice could look like in the future. Today's panel explores additional changes that would need to be made to Louisiana's criminal justice system and criminal justice system to achieve equal justice in the state. Funding for 2021 rebirth grants has been administered by the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities and provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the American Rescue Plan and the NEH sustaining the humanities through the American Rescue Plan initiative. The views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this symposium do not necessarily represent those of either the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities 
or the National Endowment for the Humanities. Before we begin, there's a few items I'd like to go over for today. There will be time allotted at the end of presentations for discussion and question uh, Q&A. If you do have a question for a panelist, please submit it in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen on the menu. And if you and for any other general information, if you're having a tech issue, please submit it in the chat and one of our background support members will uh, help assist you. At this time, I'm going to introduce our moderator today for today, uh, Mr. Rhett Covington. He is the Assistant Secretary for the Louisiana Department of Public Safety and Corrections. He has served six, he has served in this position since January 2015 and formally served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for six years. He began his criminal justice career as a probation and parole agent and, uh, and supervisor for 15 years. Mr. Covington is responsible for the Office of Reentry and Education Services. He's a designee for the Secretary of the Department of Public Safety and Corrections on the Louisiana Reentry Advisory Council and the Workforce Investment Council. Thank you so much for being here today with us, Mr. Covington. Take it away. Thank you so much, Shelley. Welcome, everybody, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, today's panel is uh, what would equal justice look like in Louisiana and how do we get there? And so uh, we have some great panelists here this morning, and I'm excited to uh, introduce our first panelist. Uh, judge Jules Edwards uh, is a retired judge from the 15th Judicial District Court, Lafayette area. Uh, he is has a 28 years of judicial service, a veteran of the uh, U.S. Marine Corps. Is that, is that, what, is that what you're a veteran of? Okay. The Marine Corps uh, and the National Guard. There you go, National Guard for 30 years. After completing his Juris Doctor degree, Judge Edwards earned both a master's degree in public administration and a degree of Master of Strategic Studies. That explains a lot, Judge Edwards, in our conversations. Welcome, and I'll let you go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Assistant Secretary, for that mercifully brief uh, introduction. Uh, and I thank uh, you for this opportunity to participate with this distinguished panel. Uh, let me begin with the caveat that the opinions I express today are entirely my own, and I'm not speaking for any organization that I am affiliated with. Uh, secondly, I want to congratulate the Angola Museum for convening this uh, symposium to facilitate the discussions on these very challenging issues. Uh, today, our topic is what would equal justice look like in Louisiana and how do we get there? Well, it is somewhat fortuitous that the regular session has recently convened, and now that the legislature is in session, it may be prudent to reflect on the way forward towards achieving true uh, equal justice in our criminal justice system. I intend to cover the waterfront from soup to nuts with a brief uh, look at each of the component parts of our system. We're gonna talk about crime prevention, law enforcement, prosecution, adjudication, and corrections. Uh, you see, I have a rather unconventional view in that I consider uh, crime prevention to be an integral component of our criminal justice system. I define justice as giving to the other that which is due. I believe that we're all called to be our brother's keeper. And as such, I believe that we each have an obligation to see that all children have an equal opportunity to uh, not merely survive, but to thrive. Unfortunately, because Louisiana remains at the top of too many of the bad lists and at the bottom of too many of the good lists, far too many of our children are not even able to survive. You see, I believe if we're able to provide a world-class education and health care uh, while significantly reducing the occurrence of adverse childhood experiences and seriously addressing the generational trauma that so many of our folks experience, we can go a long way to reducing our crime problem. You see, that's what I mean when I speak about crime prevention. The good news is that we no longer have the dubious distinction of having the highest incarceration rate in the nation. The bad news is that during the past decade, 2010 to 2020, we did have that unfortunate distinction. Uh, and also during that dec decade, Louisiana had the highest murder rate, the fifth highest violent crime rate, the second highest property crime rate, the third highest number of people receiving governmental assistance, you know, what we commonly refer to as welfare. And also during that decade, Louisiana was also 47th in education, 46th in ACT scores, 41st in literacy, 39th in healthcare affordability, 
45th in unemployment, and finally 49th in poverty. I think if we can change those statistics, we will be much, a much better off. Far too many of our citizens suffer with unaddressed trauma, mental health disorders, substance abuse disorders, physical illness and injuries. And it's time, it's long past time that we invite the public health and behavioral health professionals to participate in our city and parish criminal justice coordinating committees so that we can assure the adequacy of our responses at each intercept in the criminal justice process. Of course, that means that we need to have those local criminal justice coordinating committees in all of our localities and that law enforcement, prosecutors, public defenders, courts, and corrections need to have a seat at those tables. Now, when we turn our attention from prevention to the actual criminal justice system, uh, we need to put first things first. You see, under our system of government, the legislative bodies uh, determine public policy and, the appropriate, and they appropriate the necessary funds uh, that are needed to execute those policies that those legislative bodies determine. Executive officials propose policy options and encourage legislators to adopt the proposed policy. And then once the, the laws are executed or are enacted by the legislature, those executive officials execute those orders. Judicial officers determine what facts have been proven during a hearing and, and discern what laws that apply to the type of dispute that is before the judge, and then applies the law to the facts and renders a judgment to resolve peacefully the dispute that was brought to the court. In the United States of America, those who who govern do so with the consent of the governed. This means that our citizens must believe that our substantive and procedural law is legitimate. For the past five years, our legislature has been struggling to find a way to move away from the user pay system that has been funding our criminal justice system. Multiple organs of government are overly reliant on the payment of people who have been convicted of traffic and criminal offenses. Now, when the average person considers Act 260 of the 217 regular session and House Bill 443 of the current legislative session, they are able to recognize that both of those instruments address the payment of fines, fees, costs, restitution, and other monetary obligations of convicted people. And it's easy to conclude that we really need to move away from this user pay system. Five years is long enough to scroll with, with this struggle. We need to get beyond that. You see, ultimately, this is the reality. Governmental actors are not subsistence hunters. We should not be expected to live off of our prey. We should not be required to eat what we kill. That's not who we are. That's not what we do. Louisiana is widely condemned for using this user pay method of funding our criminal justice system. Many have concluded that it's immoral, unethical, and illegitimate. My personal belief is, and many differ, but my personal belief is all uh, legal financial obligations of convicted persons should be paid to the treasury, and then the appropriate legislative body can determine what the government's priorities are, and then appropriate whatever funds are necessary to achieve that policy directive. Again, the rule of law a legitimate process. So now uh, it, is, it is debatable uh, what kind of tasks should be assigned to law enforcement officers. And we need to have a close look at what tasks are assigned to law enforcement officers. Uh, and we need to determine whether uh, other agencies may be more effective at, at performing some of these tasks. But ultimately, that's a decision for city councils, parish councils, police juries, and the, and the Louisiana legislature. Once they determine those, those priorities and the tasks that need to be performed, they need to appropriate the funds necessary to achieve the missions that they have assigned to law enforcement. Uh, police prosecutors, public defenders, courts, and corrections all need appropriate, uh, the appropriate appropriations to fulfill the duties that have been delivered to them. Uh, I, I've, I've, I know many uh, law enforcement executives, people who are in charge of uh, directing law enforcement agencies, and many of them will freely admit that culture crushes 
poverty, policy. Culture crushes policy. You see, the culture informs what the agency does, what the individual's officers do. Policy is often a mere profession of what should be done. Too often, it is a challenge to align the behavior, the actual behavior of the agency and the officers with the professions uh, that are expressed in policy. You see, to, pro to protect and serve, that's a great logo. Unfortunately, it's often a challenge to provide protection and service to all. Uh, many of these uh, law enforcement executives will, will readily uh, assert that while it is appropriate that soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines are described as warriors, law enforcement officers, however, are not at war, and they have been they have pledged to protect and serve. And, and these chief executive officers recognize that warriors and guardians have different rules of the use of force. The concept of collateral damage is not an appropriate uh, is not appropriate for any instance of excessive force uh, that occurs on American soil. For these reasons, and and others, uh, many of these law enforcement executives would assert that the role of guardian is a much more appropriate role uh, for law enforcement officers than the role of warrior. Uh, and 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 they also recognize. Uh, that many of our existing policies uh, uh, with regard to asset forfeiture present uh, a, a significant temptation to what they say police for profit. And, and, and those temptations can be easily removed by simply uh, requiring that those assets that are forfeited are transmitted to the treasury, uh, again, then for the appropriate appropriations by the legislative body. So now as I turn my attention from law enforcement to prosecution, I will, I will note that many of these observations I made with regard to law enforcement also apply to prosecution, particularly with regard to culture and policy. Uh, and additional, additionally, while asset forfeitures and pretrial diversions, pretrial intervention programs, those all have their place, uh, but caution is warranted uh, because if those programs are not carefully constructed, uh, they, they can be abusive. Uh, overcharging to obtain a tactical advantage in plea negotiations is an, is an abusive practice and unfortunately has not been entirely eradicated from our state. <clears throat> While we, uh, conviction statistics are good, they have their place, we have to remember that just this is the goal of our process. Uh, and we, as we learned in civics class, uh, Benjamin Franklin is quoted as, say, as saying that it is better to have, that a hundred pers guilty persons should escape than one innocent person should suffer. Uh, and, and we should always remember that transparency and accountability are generally virtues in all governmental or organizations. So now I'll turn our attention to the courts. I believe that there with some simple modifications we can produce some very significant dividends. I believe we need to increase the availability of non-monetary pretrial release options in every, every parish in Louisiana. <clears throat> I'm, think, I'm speaking of things like drug testing, house arrest with electronic monitoring, substance abuse disorder treatment, mental health disorder treatment, along with habilitative and cognitive behavioral uh, interventions, as well as uh, pre-trial screening uh, within 72 hours of the arrest, uh, that can give the judge some, uh, that, that pre-trial release screening can give judge some valuable information to use during uh, the bail determination process. Now, many places in our state have some of these options, but not all. And, and I wanna be clear, I don't wanna be misinterpreted. I believe that monetary bail obligations are still legitimate options. I'm just suggesting that they should not be the judge's only tool. Our courts need to, uh, need to have automated case management information systems in order to effectively manage their dockets. The public deserves electronic filing systems, which would provide the additional benefit of the capacity to electronically publish the court's dockets. Courts also need to have the capacity to have electronic notification systems to remind the parties of court dates and the due dates of upcoming obligations. You know, nowadays, we all receive text messages from our dentists, even our auto mechanic, reminding us of upcoming appointments. Uh, there is a clear need 
for more video conferencing opportunities for lawyers and, and, and incarcerated persons. You know, Katrina exposed the need for this and the pandemic has recently demonstrated the efficacy of video conferencing, uh, particularly with uh, uh, defense attorneys and incarcerated persons. The, the pandemic has also demonstrated the efficacy and effectiveness of taking guilty pleas by video conferencing. It's really time that the legislature authorized us to take evidence during pretrial hearings. That will pay off big dividends. I, I believe that all court hearings should be trauma informed. It is important to remember that screening to determine who needs a clinical assessment along with the proper treatment of all diagnosed conditions, that's, that's an evidence-based practice that's been known for quite some time. We need to make that practice a reality in all of our parishes. So that leaves us with corrections. Uh, I, I believe that all people who are adjudicated guilty of felonious conduct should receive a risk, needs, and responsibility assessment within 30 days of their sentencing, and that the department should consider the results of this risk, needs, and responsibility assessments when making housing and programming assignments for incarcerated individuals, and when referring individuals who are on probation or parole for uh, other services. Uh, the department should provide trauma-informed hearings, assignments, and referrals uh, through, throughout all their processes. And finally, the department should continue its close coordination with the local reentry steering teams and coalitions throughout our state that are affiliated with the Reentry Alliance for Louisiana and the Louisiana Prisoner Reentry Initiative Steering Team Association as the department continues its implementation of the Prisoner Reentry uh, Initiative. Let me just say that I, as I close, the cre I believe the creation uh, and utilization of local criminal justice coordinating committees composed of representatives from the public health and behavioral health agencies, law enforcement agencies, prosecutors, public defenders, courts and corrections, that would be a very important step in the right direction. I think it's also important uh, that uh, the, there be appropriate definitions for the missions of crime prevention and law enforcement. Uh, I, will, I will end with this op observation uh, that uh, entrepreneurs and administrators know that you cannot manage what you do not measure. Unfortunately, uh, most criminal justice actors don't capture the demographic information that is needed to measure racial equity. And most of our courts do not have the information technology necessary to accomplish this task. Last but not least, all of our justice partners, crime prevention, law enforcement, prosecution, courts, and corrections need adequate resources to deliver equitable outcomes. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Judge. You've uh, you covered a lot of ground in a very in, uh, in a very short time and used every every minute you had. So I appreciate your your uh, your comments and thank you for your service. Um, our next presenter uh, panelist is uh, Jamila Johnson. She's the deputy director uh, at the, the Promise of Justice in Initiative, where she oversees policy work and special projects, such as uh, their Jim Crow Juries Project, the N Plantation Prisons Project. Um, before joining PJI, Jamila led the Louisiana Criminal Justice Reform Team at the Southern, Southern Poverty Law Center, served on the steering team for the Unanimous Jury Coalition as it ran the campaign to amend the Louisiana Constitution to require unanimous juries, and spent a decade in private practice at Schwab, Williamson, and Wyatt. Uh, Ms. Johnson? Thank you for having me today. And Judge Edwards, that was an incredible amount of content in a very short period of time. I, I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, you know, this topic is so broad that I would like to focus on a subset of what this can look like. Um, some of the past panels over the last couple of weeks have talked about what I think we all acknowledge to be unjust laws, right? And with my time with y'all, with I want to spend it talking about what do you do in the face of an unjust law? How do we get to a more just Louisiana after we identify a law to be racially discriminatory in practice and in purpose? 
And how do we get to a world that um, heals and alleviates those injuries? Um, my job for the past couple of years has been quite literally to help the state of Louisiana heal after more than a century of injuries caused by a Jim Crow law. So I'm gonna talk in context of that law a little bit about, about what this looks like. Um, I guess the general philosophy that I'd like to share is this idea that we can change a Jim Crow law. We can identify it and say, in the future, we're not gonna do this anymore. But when we do that, we so often forget that in the present, there are people who are carrying the weight of that Jim Crow practice or that racially discriminatory practice. And it is so much harder to get the courage and the political will to identify those individuals and do something about their present condition so that we don't con continue to see those injuries in future generations, right? Um, we had a day dedicated to the non-unanimous jury issue. I call it the Jim Crow jury issue. And I'm guessing that many of the people who are listening today were at that panel, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about that for those who may be joining us today for the first time, because that's the issue that I've been working on these past years. And that I think is a really good example of what you do in the face of a Jim Crow and discriminatory law to make sure that the future doesn't have the same tainted impact, right? Um, so let's go back to, to the time of the Civil War. Um, at the time of the Civil War, more than half of Louisiana's population was enslaved and one third of the prison population was enslaved. So disproportionately, we had white Louisianans and non-enslaved individuals in our prison system. Um, the 13th Amendment, of course, ends slavery. And we moved through several decades where the state of Louisiana frankly struggled in changing a world that was not built in a way to change, right? Um, and what you saw were while black men in Louisiana gained the right to vote, you also saw the emergence of, for instance, a militia who then would uh, massacre black Louisianans who were trying to exercise or register for that right to vote. In the meantime, you, would, you also saw the expansion of black codes. So if you as an individual wanted to leave the place that you had been enslaved and find new employment and find new housing, you were criminalized. The black code said essentially that if you were without stable housing or stable employment, you could be arrested, you would be convicted and you would spend one year in convict leasing. So that moment where a black Louisianan was deciding I'm going to, I'm gonna find a new life for myself and I'm gonna go to a new location and I'm gonna build the life that the constitution now allows me to build, that was criminalized. And so you saw this expansion of our convict leasing system. You saw black Louisianans trying to exercise their vote in part to change the expansion of the convict leasing system and the black codes and their impact on black Louisianans. And in 1898, all of this comes to a head. Louisiana calls a constitutional convention for the purposes of ensuring uh, the supremacy of the white race in perpetuity. How do we know that? Because that's exactly what they wrote in the liner notes of the constitution. The official journal explains that that was the purpose. All of the speeches talk about that as the purpose. And that constitutional convention does three important things um, amongst others, but three important things that we'll talk about today. The first thing they do is that they put in all those sort of grandfather Jim Crow voting restrictions. At the time, even though you might have been slaughtered for trying to exercise your right to vote, um, 130,000 black Louisianans were registered to vote. By 1922, only 598 were registered to vote. That is the power of laws and lawmaking and constitutional conventions. The second thing they did was they put in the segregation of the schools provisions, segregating all of Louisiana's schools. Another thing they did was they put in place the non-unanimous jury verdict, which is what I call the Jim Crow jury verdict, which said at the time, at least, if three of your jurors thought you were not guilty, you would still be convicted in Louisiana. And as uh, conservative justices of the US Supreme Court in PJI's Ramos v. Louisiana case explained, the purpose was to ensure a way to silence the voices of black jurors and to convict more black Louisianans. So that is like the start of our non-unanimous jury system. Right now, I think everyone recognizes that it was discriminatory in intent. And in practice, it was also discriminatory. We saw that from the analysis done by the advocate in their Pulitzer Prize winning 
um, series about the non-unanimous jury verdict in 2018. So going back to my theory on how we deal with issues such as this and how we ensure an equitable future, we can look at the non-unanimous jury verdict campaign to, to look at this, right? PJI, the Ramos case, which is what eventually um, found this practice to be unconstitutional and to have been based on a Jim Crow law, uh, that was the 24th petition we filed to the US Supreme Court. 24 times before the US Supreme Court would even hear the issue. So I'm not gonna say that it's, it's easy to change a law. Um, Norris Henderson was the statewide director of the Unanimous Jury Coalition and the campaign in 2018 to change non-unanimous juries on the ballot. Uh, that was a lot of work. That was an insane amount of work. I watched Norris go corner to corner across the state um, while I was on the steering committee. It's a lot of work to change a Jim Crow law. But we do it with some level of regularity all across the country. We're identifying these laws and we're changing them. The problem is that when you change these laws, they're not automatically addressing the people who are still suffering harm. So let me talk about what that world looks like today. There are presently 1,500 men and women who heard in April of 2020, the US Supreme Court say that their convictions were unconstitutional, that they were deprived of their Sixth Amendment right to a jury trial, and that they were based on this Jim Crow law. And then they went to sleep in the respective prisons that they are incarcerated at. For most people, including our clients, the assumption is that when the Supreme Court says something is unconstitutional and that it was based on a Jim Crow law, there is a remedy. Unfortunately, our legal system hasn't set that up and hasn't structured it in that way. And it is a tremendous amount of work to try to get that remedy. So when we're talking about how do we get to equal justice in the future, we look at the people who are carrying the weight, those 1,500 men and women who remain in Department of Corrections control. We have spent uh, $55 million since April 20th of 2020, continuing to incarcerate these individuals. Um, we are in a space right now where the fight continues to try to get um, a remedy for, for these individuals. There are, gosh, many, um, multiple bills at the state legislature this year that seek retroactivity for the Ramos decision so that the people who remain in prison despite having been convicted based on a Jim Crow law would have the ability to have their convictions vacated and a new constitutional trial. In 48 other states, right, people had their Sixth Amendment right. Why should Louisianans be deprived of that? And why, when you learn that your, constitution, that your constitutional rights have been violated and there is a mechanism that could give you that right back, why we don't do that automatically is beyond me, right? Um, but the legislation, various pieces of legislation would create retroactivity and would vacate those convictions. Does that mean that everybody goes home? No. Does that mean that um, everybody gets reconvicted with the same charge? Probably not. In a lot of these cases, the dissenting jurors, it was a question of the lesser included. Should someone spend the rest of their life in prison or should they have a fixed term sentence based on, on the evidence that was presented? If even a third of the people who have life sentences for non-unanimous jury verdicts were to get relief that made either a sentence that was not a life without the possibility of parole sentence, Louisiana would finally not be the largest um, number of life without the possibility of parole sentences in the country. We would get way below the level that we're presently at. The second spot in which this could change is that a case um, that our office is arguing at the US or at the state Supreme Court, Reddick v. Louisiana, um, is asking the state Supreme Court to find retroactivity. Um, but despite this, right, um, I think it's worth thinking about if there is no remedy, what impact this has. Um, in March of last year, I was fortunate enough to bring home a client um, through DA negotiation who had a non-unanimous jury verdict. He was convicted right after the birth of his son, his son for 12 years, um, lived without being able to have the relationship that he wanted with his dad. And his dad didn't have that relationship with his kid. And the number of children 
and the number of parents and the number of aunts and aunts who call our office every single day, sharing with us how they are impacted by this and the extra pain that comes with knowing that this was based on a Jim Crow law, that it was intentional and that it was targeted at black Louisianans is palpable, right? And that is gonna continue for those family members. And the only way to make it so that the next generation of individuals don't have the same distrust in our government, the same understanding that this wrong has occurred and continues to hurt them is to really work to create a remedy. Um, you know, Norris who's on here is, is one of those individuals, right? Who had a non-unanimous jury verdict. We can see all through our community, people who are doing incredible work to reform this system, who are people who had these non-unanimous jury convictions. And I guess for what it's worth, when we talk about how do we ensure a better future, we look at ways to reduce this harm. We look at ways to provide support to those who have been harmed. It was not the fault of judges or district attorneys or defense attorneys or, pro, uh, or you know, survivors of crime that we had this Jim Crow law in place. It was the fault of a group of lawmakers in 1898, but it's all of our responsibility to fix it um, and to fix it for those kids whose parents remain in prison, to fix it for the people who are in prison, who know that they were convicted with non-unanimous jury verdicts and to fix it for the future generation and for those jurors who've had their voices silenced. Um, I am not quite sure how long I have talked for, but I feel like it's probably more than I should. So I will end there. You were close. You had a few more minutes if you wanted to say anything more. Excellent. I should have looked at the time when I started talking. You got like, you got like three minutes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so with a few more minutes, what I would talk about is, so folks with non-unanimous jury verdicts, I think there are a lot of misconceptions about who they are and what the circumstances were. Um, I think it's worth starting with 80% of the men and women who remain in prison with non-unanimous jury verdicts are black. Now realize that 33% of Louisianans are black, 67% of our prison population is black and 80% of those with non-unanimous juries are black. Um, the advocate found that disproportionately the voices of black jurors were being silenced. You were far more likely to have your voice silenced if you were a black juror than if you were a white juror. For the folks who, um, who remain in prison, there are statements of, well, you know, they just got to 10 and stopped. And if you'd given more time, they would have gotten to a unanimous verdict, right? Um, that's, that's some talking points that I, I've heard from folks. What we see is that the vast majority of these cases, folks deliberated for in excess of an hour before getting to a non-unanimous jury verdict. Some deliberated for six, seven, eight hours, and it took that long before they could even find 10 jurors who would want to convict. What we've also seen is that these cases disproportionately have other flaws in them. Take the case of Brandon Jackson. There's a pretty fantastic documentary of, about his case. Um, in that case, the only witness who tied him to an armed robbery um, was recorded in a video statement saying that Brandon Jackson was not the person who committed the robbery. The judge in that case did not admit the videotape for the jury's consideration. Um, in that case also, we have interviews with the jurors one of the white jurors who convicted, her explanation was that he looked, too, he looked too confident. He stared her in the eye. And that was how she knew, even though the evidence wasn't all that strong of his guilt, but she knew he was guilty of something. And the black juror in that documentary explains she tried. She talked to that jury. She tried to explain that there was not sufficient evidence. There was one person's word and that person had all of the information and all of the um, items that were stolen that night. And that wasn't enough to convict. And yet we see time and time again that these cases have real significant defects in them that have not been resolved. 
Um, when you look at the um, exonerations in Louisiana, what you see is that you are far more likely to have had a non-unanimous jury verdict in an exoneration than if you did not. There's tremendous concern about the accuracy of these convictions. Um, and yet these individuals stay in incarceration. Um, and the impacts are all throughout our, our community. Um, we put in a call to family members in November um, after the Equal Justice Task Force met to talk about this issue. And we just said, if you're a family member out there and you want to be part of this, you know, reach out to us. Um, we received 890 signups to be part of, of getting information about this within a week. Um, that is how many people on the outside are waiting for their loved ones to have a chance at the protections of the Constitution that they would have gotten anywhere else. Um, in those other 48 states, if there were a hung jury, um, the prosecutors would have to retry the case. All we're asking for in Louisiana is that the exact same thing happen, that those cases have an opportunity to be negotiated, an opportunity to retry those cases if necessary, more than a third of the districts, um, the district attorneys in Louisiana or um, judicial districts in Louisiana have less than five cases. Um, the cases are not untriable. The number, the 1500 number is less than 1% of the cases that happen in our, um, in our state each year. Um, so this is something that can be fixed. Justice Johnson would testify into the legislature said, you know, it's never too late to do the right thing. Um, yesterday, I learned yet another one of my clients has died waiting for his post-conviction relief application to be decided. Yeah, it's never too late to do the right thing. But in the meantime, I'm watching my clients die in prison with these non-unanimous jury verdicts awaiting an opportunity to get a constitutional trial. So if we talk about how do we make it just in the future, we do something about them today. Thank you. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Moving on to our next uh, panelist, that's um, Mr. Charles Riddle, uh, District Attorney for Bulls Parish. Um, Charles Riddle was uh, a state representative for Bulls Parish from 1992 to January 2003. As a representative, he authored over 100 bills, with over 60 becoming law. He's practiced law in, in uh, Evolves and throughout the state since 1980, graduating from LSU Law School joining the firm of Riddle and Bennett, started by his grandfather. In 1981, he entered solo practice of law and was elected from a field of six candidates to the House of Representatives in 1992, re-elected in 95 and 99. Uh, he was elected with 60% of the vote um, in an election in 2002 to district attorney and re-elected without opposition in 2008. He has served as the president of the District uh, Attorneys Association from, for the 2008 to 2009 term. Mr. Riddle. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And uh, my area of discussion is going to be a little bit different than the first two. Uh, probably boring to some, but certainly not uh, unimportant in, in the realm of, of justice. Uh, I should add, uh, that wasn't in the introduction, for 22 years prior to becoming district attorney, I represented criminal defendants. And I served as the indigent defender for three years. And so I do have a perspective from the other side. Um, as well as from the prosecution side. The area of my discussion, pretrial diversion, is used in most jurisdictions, but not all jurisdictions. And in my opinion, is a very key uh, component in trying to establish justice in Louisiana. Uh, the main reason is because pretrial diversion prevents a person from having a criminal record and certainly from having to go to jail. Uh, the, the, the completion of pretrial diversion ends up with people who are nonviolent offenders or they're, non, they're users of, drug, of illegal drugs, but not dealers of illegal drugs. And they, of course, they haven't committed a violent offense. So it allows them the opportunity to get their record completely cleared and also to be able to expunge their record uh, a lot simpler because of the non-prosecution of their case. It also gives us some sort of ability to watch over this person as they go through the classes that we require and also to be able to establish that they have to be law abiding during the term of pretrial, uh, during the term of the diversion, which is anywhere from one year to two years for us. 
Uh, it's also important to note that um, probably the cornerstone of our pre-trial diversion is drug court. Uh, drug courts are not in every district, and I pray and hope that every district can obtain a drug court. Drug court does the same thing with a little bit more enforcement ability because of the fact that they appear before a judge at least once a week. They're drug tested on a regular basis. And of course, when they finish with, with drug court and successfully complete it, they are completely exonerated from their crime. And, and it's as though they have never been convicted. So that also allows the expungement of the arrest. Because many times when people are applying for jobs and they find out that they have, uh, the employer finds out that they have been arrested, they want to know more details about it. And it oftentimes creates difficulty in obtaining jobs. Of course, pre-trial diversion costs, and that's something that um, is very difficult to get around because in our office, and we have a, a basically small office population of almost 40,000 in our parish, uh, we have seven assistant district attorneys, six of them are involved in pre-trial diversion. We have uh, one full-time employee in pre-trial diversion and two others that are very actively involved, and of course, Every person involved in the criminal in the criminal prosecution part is involved in some way or another in pretrial diversion. I think that um, as the ADAs go through cases, many times it's the defense counsel who recommend pretrial diversion. And as we look at a case and we say, well, this person would be eligible for it. Somehow we did not uh, see it as an effort to, uh, at the beginning when we screened the case, maybe we just missed it thinking that, oh, he doesn't look like he'd be good for for a pretrial diversion, but the defense attorneys bring it up. So quite often, even at the arraignment stage, uh, which is later than normal for us for pretrial diversion, or even when the trial approaches, in many cases we do uh, handle that situation as a pretrial diversion. Um, the victim is also contacted. If, there, if it is a victim crime, um, whether it's burglary or something else, it's a, a felony, but nonviolent, we do contact the victim and let them know. And amazingly, most of victims agree with the pretrial diversion. But this restitution, restitution is obviously included in the diversion. And I think it's an effort to uh, help us not only manage a docket, but to create justice within the criminal justice system. There was a time, if you look back 10 years ago, you probably, every district, every judicial district that had a pretrial diversion program, at different standards. Uh, in the last few years, I'd say within the last five years, we've come up with uh, the LDAA, the Louisiana District Attorneys Association has come up with standards that we follow so that we have guidelines that each district attorney has agreed to abide by so that we can be more consistent among districts than have the wide variety of, uh, in the past, of different types of diversion. Again, this applies to any nonviolent and anyone who's not dealing drugs, we, uh, the, the drug dealer is not going to be eligible for pretrial diversion. I would say that in our district, and this part is different in every district, in our district, it's probably between 8 and 12 percent of felonies and misdemeanors that um, apply and uh, go through our diversion process. In some districts, it's more than that. And I think that that's more of individual inclinations of district attorneys uh, following the same standards. But it just so happens that some people want to turn down pretrial diversion. And uh, whatever the reason is, they don't want to go through it, whether it, they'd rather take their chances in court or whatever. We feel that it's been a huge success, especially our drug court and uh, those who go through the pretrial diversion program and end up with their record being cleansed and being able to uh, apply for jobs with basically a clean record uh, has been very beneficial to the people who have gone through it. The one area that we have the most difficulty in, and hopefully this will become part of the discussion, is what to do with those who have mental health issues. There are so few outlets throughout our state to be able to address this particular problem. So few, we have, I think, um, 22 different drug facilities that we access, um, drug treatment facilities that are inpatient. And virtually every one of them says if they have a dual diagnosis with the mental health problem, they can't help them. So that's an area that needs to be addressed by our state. And I would say that this problem has gotten worse in the last 15 years than it was before. 
uh, and we won't go into the political side of that, but I think some of you know what I'm talking about. If that could be addressed, that would be a huge asset to our state and the criminal justice system. I know I was a lot shorter than the others, but I'll be glad to give up my time to let the other panelists, are there any other panelists? Yeah, I think so. And I'll be happy to answer questions when the time is right. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and, and just my own two cents, I, I fully agree with the, uh, with, with the need to, to look into a better uh, community-based uh, serve uh, pro treatment programs for the mentally ill and those who yes. have co-occurring disorders, especially because uh, we, we see it uh, too often in corrections as well. Uh, we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of people who are coming to us because of that. Uh, so we'll definitely have some, hopefully have some discussion and comments towards the end on that. Uh, our, our final panelist today is uh, Norris Henderson, and uh, he's the founder and executive director of Voice of the Experience, Vote, and, and a formerly incarcerated person. Um, he also uh, founded the sister organization, Voters Organized to Educate. Uh, Norris believes that those who are closest to the problem are the closest to the solution. And as a formerly incarcerated person, he uses self-taught legal expertise, personal experience, and community organizing skills to affect system, systemic change in the criminal legal system. Mr. Henderson. Good morning. Uh, thanks for the, the warm introduction. I, um, I've been sitting listening and- uh, uh, Excuse me, uh, Mr. Henderson, I'm just, just to, and I hate to interrupt you, but can you, is there a way you can turn your volume up? Cause you're a little lower than the rest of them. Just make sure you're heard. How's, about, how's that? About the same, but you're a little low. I'm at 100 on the okay. computer, you know? Okay. Get closer uh, to the just, mic. Get closer to the mic. Maybe get closer yeah, to the yeah, microphone. That's what I do. I just speak loud. Uh, one of the things that I, uh, each of the fellow panelists address things that's particularly in their wheelhouses. I appreciate it what Judge Edwards uh, talked about, given, you know, his background as a, a jurist. Uh, Jamila with, you know, being a law firm, doing the work and uh, with Mr. Rillo about pretrial and what it looks like. And I think we need to leave the question of what would equal justice look like and how we achieve it uh, challenges us to do a little more. And I, and I say that primarily because and I would take, um, when we, a few years ago, when we started this campaign to eliminate non-unanimous jury verdicts, uh, you know, it's because this was work that we've been doing. I was uh, kind of like uh, a victim of a non-unanimous jury. But I read a book called Jim Crow's Last Thing. And when we actually won the ballot initiative to end it, we thought that Jim Crow's Last Stand was done. But to our surprise, it wasn't. And it hasn't been. And so one of the things about what would equal justice look like and how we achieve it I think that we have to ask the how we achieve it first. And the how we achieve it is one, we have to recognize that we have a problem. And I think Jamila kind of like laid out the, the road work about where some of this stuff done. If we don't recognize that there's problems, uh, there's no way for us to solve them. I'm a member of the Equal Justice Task Force. And I remember in one of our hearings that every person who had offered testimony used the word justice. And by the time it got to me, I begged the question about what the justice looks like. And we had 13 different answers. And I think that is where we have to start this conversation about how do we reconcile with the injustices that has already happened and not to take the role of punctuous pilot and washing our hands saying it didn't happen on my watch, but it happened. And I think to the extent that we are big enough as citizens of this state to recognize that this was a wrong, how do we fix it? And this ain't about who's right, it's about what's right. And I think Judge Edwards, uh, all three of the panelists in some shape, form or fashion has mentioned something about how to course correct some of the stuff that we're doing. And some of it is kind of like, Mr. Rillo talked about pretrial diversion. How do we get those kids kind of like back on the right track? Well, it takes courage to make those decisions because some people I would venture to say is not pleased with him offering pretrial services to some people. 
you know? And so we have to figure out how do we collectively look at this and approach this thing in a way. And I hear some of the other former DAs, I haven't heard Mr. Riddle say it, but I've had other former DAs say, well, what about the victims? And I always kind of like quietly raise my hand up and I say, well, I understand the strong emotions of crime victims because I'm one. In March of 2000, my son and future daughter-in-law was murdered by a former jealous boyfriend. But I also realized that in a fair and just society, we can't continue to base laws on the way we feel at the worst moment of our life. That is what Louisiana has done. Every time since the early 70s, every time the United States Supreme Court made a decision that impacted Louisiana's criminal justice system, our legislature went and became tougher. And when we talk about life in uh, life sentences in Louisiana, prior to 1973, a life sentence was recognized as 10 years and six months. The Supreme Court abolished uh, the death penalty. They went to 20 years. Two years later, the Supreme Court abolished the death penalty again. They went to 40 years. Supreme Court abolished the death penalty again. Then they say, well, you know, there's no benefits whatsoever. So over from 73 to 79, the impact of how our system actually became what it is today is because, like the judge said again, legislators, you know, who are making policy, who are actually not in the trenches, are making decisions and forcing everybody else to abide by those rules. And so I think the way we achieve this is we have to push forward. There's legislation now to make people whole. And people are still complaining about, well, and Jamila kind of touched on it. Well, well, the reason they stopped at 10 because the judge advised them that once you get to 10, you can stop. Well, the United States Supreme Court and, RA and Louisiana Supreme Court said, well, that was found to be unconstitutional about telling jurors that once you get to 10, you can stop. We've had decisions on top of decisions, the case decisions that found jury instructions to be unconstitutional across this state. Tommy Cage is the only person that benefited from that. And the only benefit that Tommy Cage got from that, but Tommy Cage got relief from debt row to a life sentence. And so where is the justice and the equality in that? And so what equal justice looked like is that what's good for the goose is good for the gander. That we should want for our brother what we want for ourselves. And that's where we're at right now. There's been a lot of, and, and, and to the DA's association credit, there's been a lot of legislation that they have partnered with us to kind of like do the, the 2017 justice reinvestment reforms. But the challenge right now is that all those things are being challenged to be undone. And it's not because they're not working. It's only because, again, going back to what the judge said, is that people are building careers off the back of people who can't literally defend themselves against a system that is rooted, that has been rooted in un unfairness. And so when we talk about this, we have to be really sincere with ourselves, recognizing the problems, acknowledging the harms done and crafting a remedy. How do we craft a remedy to fix this? Because as we continue to move forward, you have people who would never feel that the system is packing fair because they can always extract or draw on a particular situation and say, well, they didn't do right by this person or they didn't do right by this person. And one of the distinctions that we really have to make, and you know, folks always draw the line between nonviolent uh, offenders and folks who have um, created harm to people. But one of the things is we kind of like explore that, and 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 and, and Mr. Rose talked about the mental health aspect on the tail end. People who harm people nine times out of ten have been harmed themselves. Hurt people hurt people. And so until we in a position that we can address and help those people, uh, we're gonna keep spinning around. When I was inside, everybody would be talking about, oh, we need to do something for this class of people, this class of people. 
and all of them was the nonviolent offenders. But one of the things, and I think Mr. Covey can, can kind of like vouch for this, the people who kept coming to that turnstile was those nonviolent offenders. Because the person who actually had harmed somebody has actually felt the brunt of incarceration. They've been in prison 20, 30, 40, some even 50 years. So they haven't offended anybody. That one act put them in a position that where they're at. But those folks who we had given sometimes the second and third chance because we put them in a separate category only because they didn't bring harm to a person that that's what happened. If we look at our criminal code, our criminal code, Title 14, there's more crimes that's not against the person than it is against the person. Crimes against the person are the 1430s, the 1430.1s, the 1464s, the 1442s, the 1450s, and the 1450s. But everything else is against property. And so we seem to value property more than we do people. And so until we start humanizing everybody and the value added to everything and everybody, we're going to always have this us and them approach to things. And that's, I think, what we have to challenge. We have to challenge why are we still doing this? Because now, because of justice reinvestment, some of those long-termers and lifers have been released from prison and correction keeps the stats on them. None of those folks have recidivated. None of those folks, and that's primarily because they have felt the brunt of incarceration and correction has done what it was charged to do, correct. And once that behavior has been corrected, uh, folks have kind of like been given opportunity. So I think the biggest challenge for us is actually the, 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 the real question is what, what equal justice look like? And again, it's like, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Meaning just because I got resources, it shouldn't be easier for me. You know, it's like the bail process. You know, I could be the Charles Manson of Louisiana, but if they put a $10 million bail on me and I got $10 million, I can get out. Whereas the post soul who, you know, the substance abuser who may be you know, in that kind of like spiraling in, 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 in the rut, it's like we put a million dollar bond on him and he don't have two pennies. You know, that's almost like wanting champagne and having beer money. And so I think until we kind of like figure out our approach and how we make our approach equitable across the board, we're going to continue to have this conversation. The thing is, is for the folks like on this panel, and some of the previous panels that's been going on for the last couple of weeks, we have to circle the wagon and tell all these other folks is that this has to stop. This has to stop. We have to just own this stuff and recognize that today we have an opportunity to move forward. One of the biggest things that just happened yesterday, well, day before yesterday, and when we talk about uh, equal justice and what it would look like, and how we achieve it. Our legislature had the opportunity to create a minority majority district based upon the population that's present in the state of Louisiana. People of color make up one third of the population of Louisiana. With over 72 legislators in the House and over 28 of them in the Senate, voted to keep things the status quo. And so, how do a person of color? look at a situation like that and think there's ever going to be an opportunity for equality or equal justice in Louisiana. And so we have to address these things. And although the people on this panel are CJ related, criminal justice related, but that legislative decision will impact our lives for the next 10 years, will impact the economic of our communities for the next 10 years. And so what does that look like? And what does that message say? You know, when is enough enough? And, you know, like I said earlier, an unjust law is like no law at all. It's like no law at all. And the judge mentioned that, uh, I think it was the Douglas court that said, you know, we'd rather for a guilty man to go free than an innocent man to sit in prison. Well, that's good in theory, but in practice it's not happening. 
and until we kind of like make that a practice. And I, and I, one of the things I think we can start with too, because we got, and, and with Mr. Riddle has been on both sides of the fence, is that we have to change how we talk about these systems. This is not an adversarial system. We talk about it as an adversarial system. And what happens, it becomes, you kill my dog, I'm gonna kill your cat. This is supposed to be a truth finding process where you present what you got, I present what I got. The judge becomes the arbitrator in it and makes decisions about what's allowed, what's not allowed. When Jamila mentioned the, the, the one of her client's case about what one witness said and the lack of the judge refusing to allow them to see a video that would exonerate somebody right on the front end, Houston, we have a problem. And so how do we rectify that is we become truth tellers. We have to be the truth tellers. We have to carry the banner of telling the truth, saying the emperor has no clothes on, here it is. And so I think we take the collective knowledge that we have, this panel, and all the previous panels and become those truth tellers, man. We have to uphold. And one of the things I kind of like do is analogy between the, the Unanimous Jury Coalition, those acronym UJC, and what's on our seal? What's on the seal of Louisiana? Those same three alphabets. The only thing it says, union, justice, and confidence. And until people can actually believe in the confidence of what's going on in this state, they're gonna always feel that they're the other, that they're left out. And so we have to create opportunities uh, for folks to not only be a part of something, but belonging. Because that's like night and day. Being a part of something and belonging is two different things. And so until we can create a system and make these systems and make people regular everyday people who don't know how to navigate these systems feel that the system is playing fair with them is our greatest challenge. And so I'll tender right there uh, so we can start the Q&A. Thanks. That's great, thank you so much. So um, before we uh, move on to questions, did, did anybody have any follow-up or any questions based upon the panelists so far from you? Do our panelists have any questions of each other? Okay, great. So one of the questions that we have um, is uh, how are Mr. Riddle's views when this came down, this came down when you were um, giving your presentation, sir. Um, how are they received when you're among other district attorneys in Louisiana? So um, do you think they have the same, uh, similar outlook at like you do or are different? Um, that's for me, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. I think that that was a work in progress. I think that um, probably in the last 10 years, more and more district attorneys have um, come to have the same view about uh, pretrial diversion as I do. And especially after we um, formalize the uh, uniform practices, the guidelines that were established and agreed upon, um, more and more are, are feeling the same. And basically all of us agree about the mental health deficit or deficiency in our state. Well, I'm going to ask you a hey, question. The, the, put, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Judge Edwards. Go ahead. The, the question wasn't addressed to me, but I feel very confident that the, the uh, district attorneys throughout our state also believe that if we could get off of those bad lists and get and, 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 and improve uh, our position on the good list, we will dramatically reduce the crime problem. So, so one of the questions that I'm just going to throw out there for, for any of you at this point, and this is just my own question, it has to deal with the mental health uh, services. What, what is specifically, you know, if you could wave a magic wand, do you specifically think would, would be of the biggest help? There's a lot of questions of capacity and where we need it and what we need the most, whether it's acute care, whether it's outpatient, whether it's um, specialty courts, or what, what do you think would make the biggest difference for us going forward? Well, let me answer that. I'll start by answering. I think it was probably about 10 years ago when the state basically got out of the business and said, well, let private industry do it. That's just not going to happen. That's just not going to be, you know, that facilities have closed. Uh, we have outreach or out, uh, out services, but not inpatient services as much as we used to have available to us. 
And of course, it's going to cost money. I mean, that's something that we have to deal with because as uh, Mr. Henderson said, the um, dual diagnosis is just uh, horrendous. And you mentioned also the fact that more and more prisoners are going into jail because of the dual diagnosis problems that they have, as opposed to being able to take care of them either as an outpatient or an inpatient. We're very fortunate in Evolves Parish. They just opened up a private uh, place, but it's basically for more elderly than it is for youthful. It's not for offenders necessarily, but from a mental health standpoint, if we don't take care of that problem, it's only going to get worse. Well, I, I, I'll join in. I absolutely agree. Um, the reality is, as I mentioned, we, we're we're 49th. Uh, in the poverty rate. We, we have a state that has a lot of poor people. And uh, that means that we need to have publicly provided mental health care at all, at, at all levels of intensity. In, in, inpatient, intensive outpatient, outpatient, uh, you know, uh, in, in many of our parishes, we do not have a publicly funded outpatient uh, mental health program that they, they, they exist uh, in in some but but not in in very very many and uh, uh, it, it, the it, it we have had a little bit of improvement now that uh, the Affordable Care Act passed which made it mandatory that private insurance and public insurance cover uh, mental health treatment but unfortunately again the 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 medic Medica Medicaid uh, rates, reimbursement rates to providers are very, very low. And so it, it's very difficult for, to encourage private providers to accept that remuneration rate. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's the reality. We, 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 we need adequate funding of behavioral health care in Louisiana. That's a legislative obligation. Okay, so um... I would, oh, can I can I jump in? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. And I think Norris may also have wanted to jump in, but um, you know, I would just add two things to this. The first is that prisons inherently are not mental health providers and are not good at it. Um, and for the sorts of rehabilitation that we are hoping will happen while people are in, in incarceration, rightly or wrongly, but like what we hope will happen, the redemption and the growth and the skill development that we hope would happen in prisons, um, that cannot happen if people's mental health needs aren't properly addressed. And we seem surprised when we see that our recidivism rates don't change dramatically. And we look at the high levels of, of mental health issues that are, are in our, pop, our prison populations. And yet we don't invest or innovate the way that we need to, to provide care within those prisons, because inherently this isn't the place for that to happen, but we're in this space right now where we are expecting all of this growth from folks who are still dealing with very basic um, under diagnosis and treatment of, of the things that are injuring them. And prison in itself is trauma um, and is traumatic. The second thing, um, in 2017, I was um, really blessed with the ability to, to sit down with some high school students who had written a history, like a, a, their own history of their lives in this, this book collection. And one of them started reading his essay and he said, when I was five, I almost um, drowned with my city. And hearing those words, I realized, what do we expect from the young people and the folks who have gone through what they have gone through. And when we look at the lack of mental health support for a generation of folks who were in, in this circumstance, it just blows my mind that we can't figure out a way to create a public infrastructure to provide this sort of support. Um, you wanna talk about how to make our world safer? That is how to make our world safer. Um, anyway, uh, Norris. No, what, what, I, what I just wanted to add is that you kind of touched it. When you look at the last two years, we've been kind of like traumatized by COVID-19. Uh, Ida landed on our doorstep the very same day Katrina landed 16 years ago. Uh, and nobody's dealt with that trauma. There's nowhere for folks to go to deal with that trauma. 
So I think one of the things as a collective, what our legislative body has to do is to put that money back. Mr. Rivers talked about how Governor Jindal kind of like gutted all of these services. We have to put that back. We have this opioid crisis that's running through our communities that, uh, you know, years ago we dealt with it with the criminal justice system. Now we're trying to deal with it through the healthcare system, which is good, but people are self-medicating because all of this adverse trauma, trauma that nobody even sees or understands that they're going through. You know, the, all the lives we've lost during COVID-19 that's connected to everything and everybody. And so I think one of the things is that when I was looking at the legislature saying that they got this, they may have a big windfall in resources, well, that money needs to start being dedicated to the mental health of the people of this state. Because I, 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 I would venture to say, one or two more things come through Southeast or Southwest Louisiana, you know, it's just gonna be one thing too many. I mean, some of the people got hit by the tornado the other night were the same people who got hit by the tornado in 2017, you know? And I can only imagine what that trauma is like trying to put a house back together. You know, I, I, I just put a house back together from a fire. And every time I see something plugged up in the house that's not connected to something, I kind of like freak out because it's almost like that's how the house caught a fire the last time. So we're dealing with these untreated traumas every waking minute of our lives, and it's nowhere for us to go. And I think the judge mentioned is that, yeah, they got private places, but you know, I would venture to say 75% of the people in Louisiana don't even have enough insurance that they can go and get the proper treatment. And so we as a collective, and I always say we, because we're part of this. If it's to be, it starts with me. And so I think we have to kind of like continue to look in the mirror and kind of like push this envelope about what can we do? What have I done today to try to move the dial? You know, and sometimes it's having those corrective behavior conversation with some of our colleagues who don't see things the way we see and trying to convince them about, hey man, there got to be a middle ground. You don't have to come all the way to where I'm at and I have to need to come to where you at, but there has to be a middle ground. And if we can find a healthy middle ground, I think we can get to bringing about a system that is not only what it looks like, but actually one that can be achieved. Secretary, let me, let me add one more thing. It, it's important to note that mental illness is not a criminogenic factor. Uh, the fact that a person has a mental illness, that doesn't generate criminal activity. It's what's called a responsivity factor. If, if we don't address a person's mental illness, they can't focus their attention on the habilitative uh, uh, participation. Uh, they can't focus their attention on their job, their family. Uh, they can't focus their attention on the, the meaningful activities of life. And, and more often than not, they are the victims of crime as opposed to the perpetrators of crime. So, so I, I, don't, I don't want people to think that, that, uh, that, that, that folks with mental illness are more likely to commit crime. That is not the case. I want that to be real clear. But we do see that the primary, like 75% of habitual offender cases involve issues either associated with mental health or addiction. Like we do see correlations between who is being charged and convicted of certain crimes and mental health. I, I, I concur but it is the substance abuse disorder that is the criminogenic factor, not the mental health disorder, right? And if you can get somebody into mental health treatment, uh, substance abuse treatment, and if they have a co-occurring disorder, get them into mental health treatment, they can then focus on what they're, what they're trying to learn, the skills they're trying to learn with the substance abuse and thus get them on the right track. So you have to treat both, you have to treat both. But, but I, I know some people, you know, freak out and, and, and have this great prejudice against the people with mental illness. And, I, and that's what I'm trying to speak to, that, that, that we shouldn't be afraid that those are the, the people who cause crime. It's not their mental illness part that caused crime. It's other factors in their life that generate that criminal behavior. Right. It's the, it's the failing to treat it adequately that, that causes them to spin out of control and do things that end, end them up in trouble 
but that, but that in and of itself does not necessitate that they're going to be a criminal or, or involved in crime at all. Um, I think that's, that's an important distinction that we have to have. Um, so kind of hitting on the substance uh, use issues, because that's a, that's a huge uh, part of our population in corrections. I would say somewhere between 75 and 80 percent of our population at any one time has a history of this, and many of them have co-occurring disorders as well. So what research is there to support the use of specialty courts like drug courts? Um, are there some parishes that may, or drug courts that may be doing better than others? Okay, so I, let, let, me, let me take a stab at that. Uh, uh, there's been lots of studies of what works in, in, in criminal justice. And drug courts are at the top of that list. It's, it's, it's called, they, they meet the evidence-based standards. There's been studies of studies uh, that have occurred uh, across the nation, across various time periods that report that uh, drug courts significantly reduce uh, the, the amount of recidivism that, that, that occurs. That now the next kind of level down is what they call promising practices. And so that would be kind of things like uh, a monitoring courts where, where, where judges are actively involved in monitoring uh, the people who are on probation. Uh, uh, but but, but it, it's not, it's a little step down and the evidence is not as great that that is as effective. It's more effective than the passive judge, but, but there's lots of evidence that drug courts are very effective. I'm aware of no studies that rank the effectiveness of the various drug court programs within our state. The challenge is uh, that we don't have drug court programs in every parish. And, and, and that's a function of, of resources. In many parishes, uh, the, the, the judges, the, the district attorneys, the defense attorneys, law enforcement agencies, treatment providers, they, they just don't think that they have the resources to devote to this kind of intensive program that drug courts are. Also, not all drug courts are the same. So when you're comparing drug courts between state and between parishes, it's not like you create a drug court and then you're going to be successful. It's about looking at the evidence-based practices and the things that have been decided to be like most helpful for your drug court. And when we talk about the issue of equity and inclusion, there's been a lot of research on how to develop drug court programs that look at equity and inclusion and look at making sure that there aren't systems within the operation of the drug court that um, while with the best of intentions on the front end, you set it up even unintentionally and you look down at the end of the stream and you see some people are more and less successful based on drug court. There have been a lot of drug courts across the country who have been doing that and altering their practices and their structures, seeing that while with the best of intentions on the front end, they structure drug court programs that at the end are being more successful for white participants than perhaps black participants and doing the hard work to figure out how and why that is and what can be done to um, change the structure to be more equitable. That's another one of those responsivity issues, yes. Well, and, and, and your comments also, I think, uh, actually reinforce some of the judges' early comments, uh, earliest comments about just the data that we don't have in the criminal justice system and don't collect that would allow us to look at things like this and, and, and measure outcomes and make um, wise decisions or at least be able to look at areas uh, and, and, and jurisdictions that need help revising what they do so they have better outcomes. I don't, I don't think there's any judge or district attorney anywhere in the state that really wants to see people fail because that just increases their caseload and increases the public's uh, risk, you know, for them doing something that's going to harm the public. So I think, uh, I think that it's, they're doing, they're doing what they think is right a lot of times. And there's many programs out there that, that think that they're doing the right thing. And the first question we have to ask is prove it. And so what, so what, what data you're collecting? Um, but I mean, I, just from an anecdotal standpoint, throwing my own two cents out there. I know that drug courts have, have been a, a tremendous help for us if, if for no other reason than it establishes a continuum of putting the right people at the right dosage of treatment and intervention most of the time um, versus what we have without them, which is all over the place. Um, um, so there's another question back to Mr. Riddle about the, um, about the expungement. So when you mentioned the pretrial diversion, 
uh, programs, you mentioned expungements and expunging charges. Does that always happen? And how does that, how does that work? Well, for drug court, it always happens automatically. We, our drug court team provides the expungement process as soon as they successfully complete drug court. Uh, pretrial diversion is a little bit different. Um, although we had a, um, what do we call the, the free expungement, we got all the entities involved several years ago, and I think we were limited to like 32 that could participate in pretrial programs who have participated in pretrial programs and who were eligible to get in, get their case expunged, we were able to waive all the fees for that, including state police fees, because sometimes the cost is prohibitive for some people. So again, for drug court, it's an automatic expungement. For pretrial diversion, it is not an automatic expungement, but they're entitled to an expungement. The benefit is state law states that if you're not prosecuted for a case, you're not supposed to be charged a fee. So if a person goes to the clerk's office, picks up the expungement forms, gets the records, shows that there has been no um, uh, prosecution, then the charge, the uh, fee is waived. So it's there, it's available for people. Okay, great. Um, I don't see any other open questions at this time. Um, did you, did we wanna turn it back over to, um, our, our sponsors. <laughs> I think there was going to be a final thought. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. So yeah, final yeah. thoughts for wrap up. So um, let's just go down the list. We'll we'll start with our our uh, first panelist and, and go from there. Uh, I, again, uh, I, I just want to remind that that prevention is very important. Uh, if we if we can uh, adequately educate our folks, get them health care, reduce the amount of trauma that they're exposed to, that will pay us big dividends. And finally, I really think we need to end this user pay uh, system of funding all of our justice actors. Uh, the legislature needs to determine what uh, the policy should be, and then the legislature needs to provide the funds to execute that policy. Ms. Johnson? Yeah. Um we focus so much on changing bad laws and unjust laws, and we just almost never make them retroactive. Um, and we never do anything for the people who we acknowledge have been harmed by the past. And as long as we continue to do that, we are going to extend the amount of trauma and extend the amount of harm primarily on black and brown communities in Louisiana. And until we change that framework, we can't start the peeling process, which is so desperately needed for all of the wrongs that have occurred and that we accept as wrongs fully across the board. Thank you. Mr. Riddle? All right, thank you. Um, apparently, there are a lot of questions about expungements uh, based upon some of the questions I've received. And I do want to say this. There's a difference between expunging an arrest and expunging a crime you've been convicted of. Okay, the laws are very distinct and, and different concerning those two. But a lot of people think that if they were not prosecuted, that the arrest automatically goes away. I just want people to be aware that you've got to actively seek that. Um, Judge Edwards, we have to be very cautious about the user pay abolition because we got to figure out where is the legislature going to get the money? And do we state to all criminals that are convicted, you never have to pay anything other than restitution? So there, there's some questions in there. And Mr. Henderson, just real quickly, um, when you talk about the laws that are dealing with property, I, I just have to say that when it comes to a person who's had their home burglarized or their car stolen and not found or found uh, damaged several days later, they take that very personal, even though that's not considered a crime against a person. So we have to be cautious when we throw out those statistics. Oh, no, I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly on that because my windshield has been busted three <laughs> times. And so I, 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 know, I know what that looks like and feel like. But I was just kind of like giving an example of I how a criminal code over the last 40 years has completely expanded by yeah. us being superfluous with every time we look up, we're adding something, adding something, not realizing, well, this is already on the books. I remember at one time, these things were happening so fast that the legislature would just, as a repeal of clause, say any law in conflict was here by a repeal because it was just too lazy. To right. And to figure out what up yeah. 
And so I'll just use my closing moments to say that, one, I am excited by the fact that we're having these kind of discussions. And I think for, you know, the group of us that's on this panel, it's kind of like we are kind of like preaching to the choir. But one thing I always caution people about preaching to the choir, we got to make sure the choir is singing in harmony. You know, to make sure the choir is singing in harmony because we all are pushing for that sweet spot, that sweet spot that can make everybody, you know, the, the, the safety that people are asking for. And I tell people this all the time, people want to be safe in communities of color also, you know, and how do we make them have enough confidence in I think we lost it. It's a frozen moment. Well, let, let, let me jump in right now because I, I want to be real clear. I, I am not arguing for the abolition of fines or court costs. Okay. Uh, the, 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 there is a, we, our job is to uh, tailor the penalty to, to the crime and remember that it's unconstitutional to order an unaffordable fine right yes, we I have agree. to we have to make this proportionate to the to to the to the crime and again it's the it's it's a public we all benefit from the criminal justice process and so that's a public obligation and we should it should not be borne uh, or to a, to as great an extent on the back of poor people i did i did note from your comments judge that uh that you, you, when you were mentioning, you were talking about having the, the fines and fees turned over to the revenue department yes. to then be sent out through general funds. So at yes. least there's a way to collect it where the organization is kind of out of the mix. So yes, anyway. yes, yes. So, so, that, so that the courts are not dependent on the offender to buy copy paper, right? <laughs> the, 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 the offender pays the fine to the Department of Treasury the, the state has that money. The legislature decides what to do with that money. Right. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, it was a pleasure and an honor to, to be uh, moderating this session. Thank you all for inviting me. Um, Jolie, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you all so much, Mr. Covington. That was fabulous. All of our panelists, again, another wonderful panel. I, we appreciate you guys all so much for the efforts that you put into this project. Um, it has been a great fun, a great fun time. Um, and thank you to all of you that have participated and coming to join us and watch us and have these great, important, necessary conversations. Um, again, just a huge thank you to everyone involved. Um, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your weekend. And also just a note, we will be posting the recordings of each panel onto YouTube. So be sure to check back onto the Angola Museum's website next week so you can check those out. Um, and yeah, thank you guys so much. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, they're good.